right then. Hey guys, welcome. Architecture Talk Time with Sarah Colata. Today I have a guest, Stephen Drew from England. Hello. And what's really, really exciting is that Stephen is a recruiter for architects and he's an absolute expert if it comes to your career development from early stage when, you know, straight out of uni, you're looking for an internship or want to go into a paid position and then also how you evolve and get promoted and also like get up to its associate level and this is really the topic that i want to talk about today so stephen thank you so much for joining me on the talk today no problem so good to be here uh yes i used to, i came from an architectural background and what i specialize in the moment you're right it's everything from being a part to all the way up to associate associate director and a lot of my job is about speaking to someone who's at that point they've got their part free and suddenly you almost stop going to university you stop taking you know courses and there you're there in professional practice and it's very difficult sometimes to progress and not everyone knows how to do it and so different people can almost get stuck at certain parts of their career and then others excel so part of what i enjoy in my job is speaking to people at different points in their career analyzing where they're at what projects they've worked on and how to get the next step how to get more responsibility and how to work on projects which interest them as well as that then in turn getting a higher salary more responsibility should be more salary absolutely absolutely and i think that it's really important to understand that progress progression path because it's not something that we know from the very beginning of how that journey looks like. So a lot of times you go into practice and you just find out how it works in your office, the promotion mm. system, but it's not always the same within the whole industry. And so sometimes it happens that it's actually worth it to change your position and move into another office because that way you can make that jump. Um, mm. So let's talk about architects that already are in practice, you know, past yeah. work three, professionals because that's mostly my audience and I know that uh, people will very much appreciate um, that we can always kind of talk about student and entry level another time uh, but I think that this is really interesting so tell me what do you find to be like the biggest obstacle or problem that keeps happening that you kind of encounter on your career what are the issues that people kind of come to you with or where do you find people getting stuck it's a really good question so I think when you enter into industry the, the when you're a part one or part two sometimes you work on a project and it can be a particular sector right and so if you start out in healthcare or you start out in residential sometimes you can almost get pigeonholed in your career and the other thing that can happen is that you can work on certain reba stages whether it's at the front or the back and get stuck in that you can be someone for instance that's worked on residential during design stages and you haven't gone to technical. And so actually, if you're not careful that these things that you did at the start when the student, they, they catch up with you. So let's say five to six years into your career, if you're not careful, you could be really stuck on, you could be a residential front end. And actually, the more you go into your career, you almost want to be all rounded. And so the thing that can catch up with uh, some architects is that you get stuck in a certain case. So for instance, healthcare hospitals, it's very hard to move across sectors, but for instance, when the market changes, so now for instance, uh, commercial is down, residential is down and hospitals are up, but it's these kind of things that if you're one architect that specializes in a certain area, you can get stuck. And since suddenly the market dictates your value, your worth, and that can be a really hard thing to untangle. So the thing that I, I always try to focus with architects mid-career and going for an associate, you actually have to make sure that you, in essence, tick all the boxes to give yourself the most opportunity. You have to ideally carry the building through all Reba stages so that you, your employer then knows that you're someone that can handle a project, someone that they can trust and give more responsibility to. If you're, for instance, uh, stuck on front end stages, then that is one way that you could almost, you can, you can reach what I call a ceiling, you know? And when you get to these ceilings, it's very hard to move forward. You can do it, but sometimes you have to move laterally, which can be going to an, another architectural practice, which is specializes in, for instance, residential, and they're gonna give you a chance from commercial. You've gotta make these decisions as well. And it could even be moving to another architectural practice because you need to start using Revit because you're stuck in CAD. Because actually, 
Revit is fastly growing across all projects because it's required by the government and also it's getting more and more efficient. So there's certain obstacles, for instance, such as a mid in, during your mid career, if you not if you haven't worked on a BIM project yet, that could be another career obstacle. So those are a few I can think of on the on the top of my head, and it's about how you untangle that to get further, because you're not. The, the, the way with salary increases and responsibility is you have to slowly and slowly show your versatility and run projects. And if you don't, if, if you, if you get complacent or stuck in a sector or a, a certain type of REBA stage, then unfortunately you're not going to progress. Absolutely. But, and so that's really interesting. And that's indeed a very good reflection on how the career path looks like, especially in England, but I think globally as well. Mm. Um, but one thing that kind of comes to mind, uh, you know, in my line of work, I always tell architects to pretty much like focus on one niche and develop one expertise. And I, I think that that's very much what's put to like, helps you stand apart from competition because then you can be that person that provides really well a service. But how do you, in a way, like balance it? Yes, you need to grow. Yes, you need to obtain new skills. Yes, you need to be versatile. But in the same time, you don't want to be a person that does everything because a thing for everything is good for nothing, right? If you're good for everything, you're good for nothing. People say that a lot in business. So how do you balance these two things? Like, how do you progress and learn new skills and develop, but also not muddle your message to your clients being like, oh, I can do and residential and hospitals and this and that, but actually what do you do well? Well, I would argue, well, so in my analogy, you can be a specialist in healthcare, but then you will always be demanded for healthcare. And the risk is if the market goes with that, you're in a particular situation where you're less desirable. That's a fact based on what I do in recruitment. But where I would agree with you is that it's good to specialize. What I'm on about though, is that if for instance, you are the specialist of residential, you still need to get that building from the start and carry it to the end. You need to, they need to know that you are able to run that project. You are able to manage a team. You're able to carry that idea from inception to practical completion. And so I think in terms of what you're on about, if you, if you want to hone the craft, that's fine. What I'm saying though, is you have really got to carry it all the way through. It's, you can't be a front end specialist on residential projects because you need to be the person who can design the residential project and then carry it out an industry and I and then build it on site. And I would argue that if, if if you haven't built a building or seen it through the stages, then you're not gonna design the same because you you actually the mistakes that you make and the and the things that happen on site will inform your design the next time. And so in this analogy, uh, Sarah, then Yes, you'll become in the expert. My worry is though, you can't say, I just do front end design because then what happens when they want the specialist to build the building on site? You have to carry it through. So I guess what I'm trying to say is you have to have a well-rounded experience around that. And just, I, I personally, maybe, yeah, you don't want to work on hundreds and hundreds of different typologies, like one museum, one laboratory, one, and I, I, but to put all your eggs in one basket is difficult, because let me tell you, if you've worked on education schools in, in, in the UK, that is what you do, and it's very hard to move out of that, and so I would argue that being a person that can carry a building from start to end is a specialty in its own right. And if you can manage a team that, and, and carry the building through, then actually what we're talking about is that your specialism is that you are a very, very good all-round architect who can deliver certain particular buildings. If you are someone that can deliver buildings over 50 million residential and, for instance, lead a team of one or two people from start to end, you are always going to have a job. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it's really important to kind of like clarify because a lot of the times when I talk about architecture, I refer to, to already business owners. And I think that when you communicate your offer and what you've got, 
you know, to like, what is your service that you put out into the market? And you communicate a lot of times to clients or developers. You obviously mm. need a very clear message, but it really it doesn't cross my mind when you are like doing a full, like if you are providing a service that you would only do front end. Like, I think you really have to be able to carry it through. And so, and so I think that um, you're absolutely right. And it, it, that's really where the distinction is between business owners and people that are employees. Because when you are going out there and you're looking for a job, you know, you need to think about what that company is doing and what is the process of the project, right? If they are, they're not just designing, they're obviously also working with the clients, they're, they're carrying budgets through, they're managing constructions a lot of times and then delivering the project. So are you equipped? really to kind of really provide value there for that business and and then that truly is being able to carry it through the project so um sure yeah so on that note let's just focus on employers and once they once they are let's just say you know growing their skill set and trying to get really good at design managing a team of designers in the office but also you know to work with budgets with clients and on the construction side and um, where is that moment that you can, you know, really understand that you can push your career further and, you know, push for, for growth there? Like once you obtain those skills, become really good at Revit, you know, also become a leader, perhaps have a position of leadership where you have a small team. What's next? Good question. So I would say in terms of when and, and what. So when, in my opinion, is when you've carried a building through through all the Reba stages. So think of it like your magnum opus. When you've taken one building and you've seen it from start to end and you've managed a team and all the obstacles, you've got to really think now, now is the time to talk about this stuff or to, to bring it up to my employer about the next step. Because once you start going back into that next, uh, that next task, Sarah, then we're on another conveyor belt and some projects, as we know, can go on for a year or two. And it's very hard mid top uh, mid mid project because everyone's so busy to go for it. So it's a perfect swan song. It's a perfect time to talk about this career. And what is a really good question? So you got to think where you're at, and you need to think backwards. So you need to you got to you got to think where do I want to be in ten years, and what's the next steps? And so for me, you got to think of. to get to the next step of one year to then get to where you want in 10 years. So for instance, if you are your first project, then you really need to speak to your employer and say, what I've done is I've delivered this building and I've shown I can do it. Now I want to take a team of one or two people more. I've developed uh, good relationships with one or two clients. I want to build on that. And therefore, if we're going to do this, I'm going to win on more work and I'm going to uh, manage a team. Therefore, I'm taking on more. Be reflected in my salary. So let's talk about the next step. Let's talk about what we can do together. So I propose that I take on this, this, that, and therefore I'm an associate, and therefore my salary should be reflected upon that. And do your research on the salary. Go in there and ask what you want and be very clear about it. You're going to say, for instance, I'm on £38,000 now and with this experience and doing the next step, which I'm excited to do with you because I care about the company, I think that my salary should reflect an associate at £45,000. So that's how I would go about it. Excellent. I really like how you um, brought negotiations into it. I actually wanted to ask you about this because in that private a private conversation that we had prior to that you told me that you also advise architects on negotiations and i find that sure. this is like a little bit of like a weak spot for a lot of people uh you know even if you are confident and outgoing and all that stuff you might have blockages around basically asking for money and understanding how to um, approach it but really it's kind of in your um, responsibility it's you who has to kind of go after it because if you don't ask for it a lot of times you might not get promoted so um, so you know yeah you need to know how to fight for that as well and uh, so what kind of interesting tips can you give architects in respect of negotiations and talking about salaries so you already told us that you know go out there be clear and understand really your goal and what you want and also know the market you mentioned but what else is there 
What else? What well, in terms of salary? Because you cut out a bit there, Sarah. Well, uh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I just hope that it's not going to get recorded like that. But um, yeah, basically, I was uh, just t wanting to ask a little bit more about the negotiation side of things. So, in terms of carrying through negotiations about money and salaries and when it comes to actually getting promoted um, I think that a lot of people have blockages around that so it's really um, interesting to to hear your opinion about you know and advice about how to go about negotiations okay fair enough I mean it did break up quite a bit there Sarah I will be honest but in terms of negotiations right you the the kind of I always joke about the British thing is that we never talk about money right and that is absolutely insane because being a professional money is important and money as far as i'm concerned is a motivator so what you need to break mentally is this idea that this in if you were in your yearly review i remember where I, one of the places i worked before it was said you do not talk about money and in every review i talked about money and you know what my employer because of it went oh well he's a go-getter and i would always say look the way i'm here is the way i'm out on the on the on the on the job you know I represent you it's the same thing I'm always looking for the best deal the best opportunity well and that needs to be reflected here so you first of all you definitely need to push negotiation but remember you're not just asking for money for the sake of money you're remembering that you're getting more money but you're in turn are saying that you're gonna do more responsibility and that you're actually in return for the higher salary, you're going to add more value to the business. You are valuable. The more experience that you do, the more valuable you become. And in, when you have more value, then you should be paid more. So you do need to negotiate and you do need to say that. And that's what I would do. I would pretty much say that you, <laughs> you, uh, you've grown, You've learned all this, where you want to go, what you want to do, and in return, you're going to have a salary in mind. Absolutely. You broke now. I really hope that this is not going to affect the quality of the recording, but if it does, I know. I cut I, out some bits. I think, I, you may, I, think that, I think it cuts out there. But you could, you, I think, edit it. So let's talk about it again, negotiation. So salary, you definitely should ask for a salary you think is fair. Key thing, before you go into that, research the salary that you believe that you should, you should be paid. Bring it factual evidence, bring out salary guides, have it there just in case. Do not go into the, to the meeting nervous don't feel ashamed to bring up salary that's the faux pas everyone does everyone goes i can't talk about money and it is it that is a big mistake because when you're going and you're asking for more um, salary what you're reflecting is and, and you need to remind them is that you've learned more you've just carried a building through and the point is the next project you're going to increase even further and what you're saying is you love the company you represent what they do and you're going to take everything you've done to the next level and you're going to run a team and you're going to you you, you know how to manage people now and you've learned so much therefore your salary needs to be reflected with your skill set and be quite upfront be transparent and be proud you're like i love it here it's great i've learned so much i really enjoy part of it we just need to take as I'm, as I'm progressing and we're going to the next stage in turn let's let's talk about the salary because i really want to be an associate because you know i can do it you know i have done it you know i represent the company you know when i go out there i absolutely love uh, john smith architects and the next building is going to be great in, t in return though I, I i i we need the salary to reflect that keep me happy keep me motivated and uh, in line with all the new skill sets we've done. How exciting is the next step going to be? Let's talk about it. What salary can we agree? Is the forty-five thousand okay with you? It's the market. It's what is the. It's what's fair in the market, and will get me excited. And then we can go back on to the next project. What do you say? And that's the kind of tone you want to go because it's excited and it's for and it's forward. What you don't want to do is this kind of like, oh um uh. Can we talk about maybe, you know, I hear that maybe we could do 45 and, you know, maybe, maybe that, maybe that's what, the, and then it's just all gone. 
got to be really, you've got to really stand up for what you've done and, and what you've accomplished and, you know, how far you can push it. And the truth is, if you've got a salary that does reflect what you're worth and, and you're proud, then you're going to go in there, all chest up, you're going to do your best work and that's going to be under their brand. And therefore, you're a much better employee and, and they're going to they're gonna get more out of it because you're pumped, you're going give, to give it your all and you'll pay the first salary. And it's because you were really... You really took the moment to, to ask for the salary when was the appropriate time. And the best time is when the next projects come in, not mid project, because they'll go, Oh, we'll discuss that at the end, Steve. You know, you, it's just so much. You go, Right, I've just delivered the amazing project and I can't wait for the next step. Let's talk about it now. And don't let the conversations go on more than a week or two. You've got to go, John Smith Architects, John Smith for John Smith Architects. Let's talk about it now. Let's get it right before the end. I know you're busy. I know you're busy as well, but let's make five minutes to talk about the salary. And you, you rehearse it in your head succinctly the points. Who, what, where, when, why. Who I am, what I've done, where with the project, where do I want to go, when can we talk about it now, and why. Because I've done X, Y, Z, and this is what I'm worth, and I'm excited to be here. So there you go. That's kind of my thoughts on it. Excellent. I'm giving you a rise. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's do it. <laughs> no, I love it. You convinced me, absolutely. And I think it's such a good advice and really it's very much about the certainty you carry through. Um, you know, and yeah, just guys, remind, remind, remember to be confident and also like value the path that you've you know, the long, the long journey that you've gone through already, which is, you know, which is the education as well as the practice, you know, the internship and everything you learned in the practice because um, yeah, it's just like, it's based on that value and your journey that you will get the promotion. And um, what about architects that are not in employment and they are looking to get employed? Is there, um, you know, the process is surely a bit different because you're competing Very with- different. Yeah, yeah. It, can, it, can, it can be, if you, if for instance, you've been out of work for a little while, do not worry about it. I always think, that if you've got a gap, explain it. And obviously keep yourself busy in the gap. There's not, oh, go on Netflix and chill out. You've got to, you know, get it. Well, if we, if we're, if your viewers here are here for a reason, which is a start, right? And that's the point. You're, you've got to take control of your career. You've got to take control of where, who you are and what you're going. And you've gone, look, I've been out of work for free. I've been, look, while I've been looking, I've been doing this, this, that. I volunteered for the Arctic Society. I've done this. I've done an entrepreneurial course and I'm here now and it's good timing and I'm ready to go. And then he's like, oh gosh, okay, that's fine. And like, but you know, if you kind of go like, oh, you know, for four months I've been doing that. No, we've got to be busy. We've got to be go-getters. And in terms of um, when, you, when, you, when you're looking for a job, do not, uh, do not let the fact that you haven't got a job mean that you can't negotiate and mean that you can't lose that spirit. You don't want to and, and this is the thing, it's really good to go on the job search because what you don't want is when you're out there and you engage with it, you feel like you're tackling the problem. But if you disengage with it and you let it go over time, what happens is mentally in your head, that gap and that worry and that nagging thing in your head of, oh gosh, can I do this? And it, where's my value? That will grow and grow. So, you, so I think that when, you, when you're in between or you're looking, let's say no, perfect timing right now with COVID, you know, you just pretend you've been made redundant, right? Just got to hit it hard and get out there and embrace it and go, I've been made redundant because of COVID, right? But I'm here, I'm ready to go. And if you're a business owner as well, because I used to run a recruitment business, you know, sometimes I left through a business at a certain juncture because uh, I, I, where I wanted to take the business with my business partner at the time, we, we, we just went our separate ways. And, it was, and I, I remember after it, you know, you're like, oh gosh, really? Have I got to do it all again? Or oh, who am I? And and you, I'm asking all these things. But the thing is, you just you have to go out there and brave the brave the the new territory. And it was through setting up a second business that then I I eventually worked. I spoke to the chap for where I work now, the owner of McDonald and Company, and we had a really nice organic conversation. And then I joined. And if I didn't put myself out there, I wouldn't have got the job. And I was punching above my way and I was on my own and I was like, you know what, we're just going to keep going. And so it was really good. We just, it just powered through. And that's, and that's my thing. It's like, keep going, man. 
never stop, right? Relentlessly, the person that goes after their, in the pursuit of their ambition, the people that are on that, I'm sorry, but if you're on the first, great time, but you really need to be out there and you really need to be talking about your next book. talking to your friends and networking and, and really pushing in. So that's my thoughts. Absolutely. Amazing. So yeah, well, thank you so much for your advice. Uh, Ooh, any no last words that you know are important for architects already in business that are looking to grow and expand their career? Oh, I think you broke up there. The last words. Okay, we'll go for it. So you can find me at McDonald and Company. I lead the architecture team. It's a fantastic recruitment consultancy where we specialize in architecture and also real estate and development. So we can also, another time, Sarah, talk about if you're an architect and you want to work for a property developer, that's something I specialize in. And also right now, social and we have been doing some interesting stuff with students and we're, we're soon branching out. We've got all these weird and wonderful and cool stuff and work and architects and on for the wild ride. Right. Awesome. Brilliant. Thank you Can for you, having me. Thank you. Can you repeat the last sentence because it broke twice and I don't have it, so. No worries. Talk about the, uh, the student, the um, architecture social. Okay, all right. So the architecture social has been going for a grand period of one and a half weeks and we have 300 people and let's just see where it goes. So for me, it's all about even, I, st I, I found the domain, I set this thing up, but you know what? It's a community for you guys as well. So I want to see it go weird and wild. And right now, I think today, Sarah, we've got the first employer on board. So actually, all these students posting work and architects are joining and so in terms of the professional discourse and who knows right employers can talk to students architects and business owners can put their work on there and why not let's showcase people's work let's showcase their business you know if you've done a project then talk about it i love that i had a recruitment business but hey I'd love to speak to architecture owners and you can go on there and look for your next graduate for, for all I mind and send them a message. You might scoop up your next talent in the office. So come on down, check it out and have a little bit of fun. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, guys. I will put the link to the uh, profile under this conversation so you can just go and sign up straight away. Uh, thank go you, Stephen, so much for joining. No. I love your energy. I think you've just given some amazing advice and thank you so much for your time. Uh, I know you got to go, but uh, yeah, we'll connect soon as well. Thank you guys for listening. Um, just keep moving upwards in your career, right? Up. That's up, right? Up, up, up. Let's do it. You say hello and drop me a note and link. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. That's what I do for a living. <laughs>